it is undeniable that indian documentary is definitely doing significantly better than indian fiction relief i think it um, it came at around i think 2 am our time so of course it was an entirely and utterly sleepless night the relationship between this one family and this one bird called the black kite and it's in that relationship that we tell the story of delhi itself that's essentially what the film is about see the thing is when you live in delhi the air itself takes on such a palpable visceral heavy gray tactile kind of a almost you know lived and embodied feeling over time the thing is boredom is the strongest weapon in your toolkit not just ben bernhard but also our editor charlotte banks and is also an absolute master how is it that in the last few years indian documentary ha- indian documentaries have indeed done extremely well on the global stage Hello and welcome to News 18 Shosha. I am Shweta Bhattacharya and today I'm joined by filmmaker Shanik Fenn. Hi Shanik, so good to have you here. Hi, and, very nice to be here. And congratulations on the fact that your documentary All That Breeds uh, has been shortlisted for Oscar 2023. Um Thank you so much. Has it all sunk in? I suppose um you know uh, sinking in is a long winded process and um given that the dates are announced uh, uh this much in advance one is constantly playing out the alternate timelines in one's head right so uh, it has sunk in um but also there's a long way to go right the this is not the nomination just to clarify uh, because um, essentially there's still some time to go and many hoops to jump through before one reaches that stage and uh, what was your first re- uh, you know initial reaction like when you heard about it relief i think it um, it came at around uh, i think 2 am our time so of course it was an entirely and utterly sleepless night but apart from that of course one is you know utterly besides oneself with joy and thrilled and relieved because you know the film took a large part of all of all of our lives and um um i think initially it's just a question of the really raucous phone calls to all the crew members and it's very jubilant and all of that and um i uh, always get a bit suspicious of happiness um so for me it's often um just basically the calculus of what is to be done now for the next steps right and um let's talk a little about your film um So it traces the lives of two siblings who have devoted their uh, you know kind of youth to rescue birds and treat them mm-hmm. yeah and mm-hmm. uh, so while filming it how much of it did you have in control like in terms of the creative aspect as well as in terms of trying to portray their lives on screen how did you maneuver sort of Well firstly let me just say that if you see when one strips it down to that kind of a log line it really presents a kind of anemic and um, inaccurate sort of a representation it's a dif- difficult film to uh, present a single log line to, uh, to of course um, i think it's better to talk about it as a kind of a broader ecological philosophical emotional and socio political um, investigation of um, the relationship between this one family and this one bird called the black kite and it's in that relationship that we tell the story of delhi itself that's essentially what the film is about in terms of control over the characters see the thing is that in creative non fiction what you're doing is of course your basis is a kind of a observational what's known as a verite form of filmmaking where you know life itself unfolds and you're turning up there to just shoot it and then you know we shot for 3 full years so we have a mountain of footage and to call out 90 minutes from it is you know we have a lot and lot of footage but having uh, having said that it's not like a traditional conventional verite observational documentary where there's there's also creative treatment of actuality and we've used poetic lyrical styles to you know to push some of our ideas so it's a sort of thing where the basis is that kind of a uh, where you know at the heart of it is a kind of um radical embrace of the unscriptedness of the world but at the same time there is also a kind of creative treatment of things so there is control um so th- in a way the treatment is creative but at the end of the day we were turning up every day and shooting this one family for three consecutive years all uh, right and um so before we move further along uh, in the conversation 
how how did this story come into being how did you meet uh, these two siblings uh, did you know them uh, from before well i think the film um the film sort of began to t- to to take shape at least in texture you know like film initially comes like a ineffable glow at the back of your head before you know anything right and i feel like initially what happened was that see the thing is when you live in delhi the air itself takes on such a palpable visceral heavy gray tactile kind of a almost you know lived and embodied feeling that uh, you're always aware of the medium that you're suspended in i e air right so i wanted to do something on the tone or the texture of life or the kind of grayness you know that color of grayness that is actually right now in delhi i'm actually visiting home currently and um so i wanted to do something on that and i was interested in, philosophically in human non human relationships mm-hmm. so i was interested essentially in how does one think of the juncture between human non so essentially it came as a kind of weak tone at the you know it was initially kind of sensorium so i was interested in the abstract triangulation of air birds humans and that's how it began and once i started researching people who had a profound or a deep relationship with um um birds or the air you start coming upon the work of the brothers and once you visited them and seen this singularly remarkable mm-hmm. work that they've done and how inherently cinematic their basement is where they work it then you know film is like a free fall it's like a fever dream that takes you on there so i think that's when it initially began right um so you know i i was going to another interview you, of yours where you mentioned that there's this common joke between all documentary filmmakers about um how the camera starts rolling and it's like an action moment when your subject starts yawning so well uh, um how yeah long well thing, right well the thing is and uh, not between documentary filmmakers that would be a f- expanding of uh, what is a in crew code they in within our crew i meant so the thing is that what i meant is that initially you know how do you get real everyday natural behavior in front of the camera if somebody comes to your or my house and just shoots us initially we would be very conscious right the camera would be a very obtrusive big presence so um i think what happens is that initially the first month is just you going through kind of rites of passage where you're earning the stripes of trust and ca- people getting used to you so essentially uh, you know because people otherwise just freeze and they're projecting their best selves or the curated selves in front of the camera but it, over time the thing is boredom is the strongest weapon in your toolkit <laughs> you know it's like you can really use boredom to and the ambition of the documentary is to get a kind of everydayness everyday mundane quotidian banal texture to life right that's what you want your material to be soaked in and that only happens when once the first yawn comes you know after people get completely bored of your presence is when useful material comes the first one month in terms of usable material is otherwise junk it's trash but it's still super important because you need to go through it to arrive at a moment when you know you're there and you're embedded in that space that's what how i meant that boredom or you know that first yawn is crucial your film has three cinematographers yet mm-hmm. uh, the visuals in the frames are so seamlessly tied up how did you ensure that happened It's a good question. So the thing is, there are two main uh, DOPs. There's um, this German uh, uh, DOP called Ben Ber- Bernhard, and uh, the, uh, the Indian DOP called Riju Das. And the thing is that, uh, look, when you've shot for three whole years, it's very difficult, especially for uh, people who are doing camera, who are used to doing smaller stints and moving from project to project, right? it's extremely difficult and especially when we are shooting when the pandemic is coming and going in the middle right so there ta- there are long halls in the middle where everything is entirely shut down and then there are long halls where things are open again so it kind of waxes and wanes and in that sense it's very difficult to get uh, you know like commitment for 3 years is a really difficult uh, task so of course we had to like ben came in and then the pandemic happened so he had to go back to germany and then we had to you know it was difficult for him to come back in so on so we had to move but in terms of uh, your question about maintaining a kind of a cohesive uh, voice throughout the thing is it was really because we basically had a very strict kind of grammar in the film the film language is of these slow languid pans or these slow languorous kind of till downs and track ins and so on and that's a kind of 
a strict grammar that we had developed uh, initially with ben and then evolved with riju so that we tried to stick within the circumference of that grammar but more than that it's also me and the directorial team right we are also constantly and uh, you know a lot of it is also the edit so the that kind of a cohesiveness is uh, our editors charlotte bengtson this danish editor and vedan joshi worked very hard to have a kind of so the fact of the uniform uh language underwriting the film is not just about the dps it is as much about the edit and i have to ask you this how was it uh, working with somebody uh, of the likes of ben bernhard i mean um initially uh, actually i've been very fortunate in that not just ben bernhard but also our editor charlotte banks and is also an absolute master who's done massive uh films like act of killing and truffle hunt they're like monumental films right uh, so has ben of course uh, is worked with victor kosakowski how it uh, developed is that initially when we were shooting i knew that i wanted something of that cinematographic caliber and um the thing is the some of the films he's shot like uh, vivan la santipodas or aquarella are cinematographically at least uh, they're enormous they're like really magisterial works and i was it was a bit of a dream to get that caliber of a dp for me and i basically out of the blue wrote him an email mm-hmm. about a obscure quaint indian film about uh, black kites about you know chills in uh, delhi so um thankfully he responded and th- there on ensued a long series of conversations between him and me where he wanted to understand and i wanted to understand and effectively i wasn't sure who was interviewing who so um in that sense it uh, and i was very lucky to be able to have him and that sort of became a kind of um quantum leap in terms of her aesthetic quality in the film lastly before we conclude this uh, i would really want to ask you uh, about how the documentary circuit here in india has seen so many achievements over the last one or two years so mm-hmm. what's your whole point of view about that well uh, i mean i keep getting asked this if uh, we are indeed um, in the golden age of indian documentary of course i mean that's very hyperbolic and exaggerated but i think it's worth some dissecting which is that uh, how is it that in the last few years indian documentary ha- indian documentaries have indeed done extremely well on the global stage you know it's like between um you know sushmit and rintu's writing with fire which was at sundance was nominated in the academy last year um there's um uh, pail kapadia's night of knowing nothing which also won at can otherwise there was uh, an insignificant man before that um this year a film that is coming is that uh, is going to go to there's a new film is going to go to sundance called against the tide so of course there's a moment where it is undeniable that indian documentary is definitely doing significantly better than indian fiction than our fiction counterparts right uh, at least in the festivals we have gone to sundance we've gone to can we like won all the festivals at the bfi and so there's clearly a kind of pattern that is emerging to my mind that is however one shouldn't be overly euphoric about it firstly because you know there's still tons of problems we still don't have a stable dissemination infrastructure people still we don't have a proper distribution circuit films are still struggling to get distribution there's only one or two breakout documentaries every year we obviously need a far more robust documentary circuit and so uh, like in terms of distribution and funding and so on a lot of the funding is coming from abroad we have very sparse funding inside india so all of those problems are still there so i would say that we have to be only at best guardedly cautious or cautiously optimistic you know about this like be a bit guarded in our optimism but i think it has to do primarily with two factors one is that you have um you know documentary labs or pitching forums where you where i learned a lot of things about where do you raise funds from how what the language of the film should be how do you pitch it how do you all of that so there are things like doc edge in calcutta for instance that helped me for uh, like certainly in uh, finding out more and also there's a growing now community of documentary filmmakers which who kind of help one another and there's now growing awareness of the resources and the languages to deploy to tell the story so i think you're right in diagnosing that there is certainly a moment that's happening where we're doing uh, well but finally to finish this answer let's not forget or diminish the work of the former masters who've done you know like uh, there's a whole line of former masters who've done a lot of work in the last 20 years you who you cannot negate but it is undeniable that right now in the last 2 years 3 years there's a big moment that's there's a tectonic shift that's happening for sure Uh well thank you so much for joining us today. 
and all the very best thank, thank you thank you so much